Okay, yeah, thank you very much. My name is Tibor. Um, now from Wuppertal University, so my first talk with my new affiliation. Um, and this talk is about uh, practical and tightly secure digital signatures uh, and authenticated key exchange, joint work with many other people. So this is going to be more like a survey talk uh, where I would like to point out what the, what the technical challenges are that we face and what are common techniques that we use to overcome these. Okay, so first of all, very quickly, what is authenticated key exchange? Um, so we have two parties, user U1 say, uh, this user has a public key and the corresponding secret key. Uh, user U2 has a key pair as well, these are the long-term keys of both parties. And uh, these two users are connected over an, an uh, insecure channel and they run a uh, cryptographic protocol, an AKE protocol. Uh, and the result of this protocol is a shared key K. Um, and essentially the security guarantees that each user um, uh, expects from this protocol is that uh, nobody except for the other users knows any meaningful information about the shared key. Okay? So more formally shouldn't be able to distinguish K uh, from random. So if you want to analyze uh, security of uh, AKE protocols, first of all there are plenty uh, different security models and in fact uh, I'm, I'm, I'm almost sure that there are more security models for key exchange protocols than actual key exchange protocols, which is a bit weird. Um, but uh, they all more or less uh, follow the same approach. So what we consider is an active attacker. Um, and this attacker is uh, provided with an, say, execution environment. And uh, this basically means that, uh, well, there are plenty of users. Each user has its own uh, key pair. And first of all, the attacker controls the entire network. Uh, which basically means that uh, whenever we want to send a message from user, uh, say, U6 to user U3, then we give it to the adversary. The adversary may decide whether it wants to forward this message or not, uh, and then uh, send it to this user, modified or whatever the adversary wants to do. Okay? So first of all, attacker codes controls the network. Second, um, we want to enable the attacker to become an insider. And this means uh, it uh, may corrupt users. So in the formal model, this is some sort of corrupt query. So the attacker asks corrupt to user U2, receives back the corresponding secret key, and from this point on is able to impersonate user U2. Then uh, we want to make the attacker even strong. So we allow the uh, uh, attacker to reveal keys of certain sessions. So basically what the attacker could do is it could forward all messages between user uh, U1 and U2 and at some point decide that it wants to see the secret key that belongs to these two users. And finally, uh, we define security via the so-called test query. And this means that the adversary picks two users which, uh, uh, which have not been corrupted and which do not correspond to a session that has been revealed previously. And it gets back either the real key shared between these two users or a random key and the um, task of the adversary is to decide. So this is the test query. If we want to uh, formally prove that an AKE protocol is secure, then we do this by a standard uh, reduction. So basically, we have some algorithm R, which, uh, let's say, simulates the environment of the adversary. And uh, the, the, the job of the reduction is to, to show that uh, for any successful adversary, which breaks the security here, so which distinguishes uh, the real key from a random one, uh, we can solve some computationally hard problems, such as factoring integers or solving <coughs> discrete block problem or whatever. Okay. Um, yeah. So this is, uh, I guess you all know this. So maybe these slides were just here to 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 establish my notation. Okay. So that you see um, uh, what refers to what. And uh, yeah. So we say that a reduction is tight if uh, basically this fraction here, so success probability of the running time. Uh, of, the, of the reduction divided by running time of the reduction is approximately equal to the success probability of the adversary divided by the running time of the adversary. Okay, so this is sometimes called the work factor of the reduction, this is called the work factor of the adversary, and they should be approximately equal. And if they are equal, let's say up to a small constant factor, like 2 or 10 or whatever, um, then uh, we say that the reduction is tight. And in, in this sense, it closely relates to security of uh, the protocol to the security of the computation problem um, that we reduce to. Okay, uh, by the way, interrupt me with questions, of course, at any point, right? Um, 
Yes. And in many cases, and in particular in, uh, for authenticated key exchange protocols, uh, reductions are not tied. So what we very typically have is that the running time of the reduction is about the running time of the adversary, because the running time of the reduction essentially corresponds to running the adversary and then simulating a couple of users around the adversary, which is uh, uh, maybe negligible compared to uh, a large amount of time that we would grant the adversary. But often we have that the success probability of the, uh, of the reduction is uh, smaller, significantly smaller than the success probability of the adversary. Um, this is typically because the reduction, for instance, has to guess uh, one or two parties involved in the test session in order to provide a proper simulation. Okay, this is where the loss comes from. Um, yeah, so uh, we are interested in tight security, which means we want to have this loss here as small as possible. Um, why is this interesting? Uh, first of all, it's an interesting theoretical question in its own right, I believe. So, uh, uh, is, is it uh, how close can uh, AKE protocols be connected to computational hardness assumptions by breaking RSA, solving the speed lock, and so on and so on? But from a but uh, yeah, probably more important from a practical perspective is that uh, we need to take the tightness of a reduction into account if we want to select parameters for a crypto system in a way such that this is backed up by the security proof that we have. Okay? So if you want to choose, nobody does this today in practice, okay? and this, is, this makes a lot of sense because we have only few tight reductions. So um, for instance, if you would want to run TLS with theoretically sound parameters, we would probably need RSA moduli of size 60,000 bits or whatever, so ridiculously large, okay? But, uh, of course, our goal is to create protocols where we can choose parameter in a theoretically sound way, okay? Otherwise, one could say that all the security proofs that we have are somewhat pointless, because what they guarantee is, let's say for TLS, um, that we can turn any adversary breaking TLS uh, with respect to a reasonable uh, number of parties and a reasonable number of sessions per party into an adversary which breaks the RSA problem with 200 bit RSA or something like this. Okay? And this is of course a very weak security statement because we know that we can break RSA for these parameters without using the adversary. Okay? So this is, this is not good. Okay? So, um, yeah, a tight reduction allows us to choose optimal parameters while um, we are able to benefit from the uh, uh, security proof that we have. Okay, so, uh, yeah, as I uh, said already before, many AKE protocols do not have a tight security proof, and um, for AKE protocols, often the security loss is particularly bad in the sense that it typically grows quadratically in the number of users times the number of sessions per user. Okay? So think about a, let's say, a relatively small scale setting with 2 to the 10 users and 2 to the um, 10 sessions per user. Uh, then we have a security loss of 2 to the 40. Okay? So we lose 40 bits of security and have to increase our RSA modulus uh, accordingly. And of course, it's even worse if you think of large scale applications like, I don't know, key exchange for Facebook or whatever, okay? with millions or billions of users. Um, this quadratic loss is, uh, appears in almost all uh, previously uh, proven secure key exchange protocols, so high efficiency protocols like HMQV, Naxos, TLS, EMV, and so on and so on. They all can uh, not be instantiated today with theoretically sound parameters unless we are willing to pay some ridiculously penalty uh, in the choice of parameters. Um, yeah, the reason is always the same. We have to guess two session arguments. Um, so another reason why uh, this is particularly bad is, uh, well, if this loss here depends on deployment parameters, like the number of users, number of sessions, and so on, and uh, we want to use a protocol and an application where we are not yet sure about the number of users or the number of sessions, and so on, and so on, then we do not know at all how to choose our parameters. Okay? And uh, this is... Uh, this is worrying because in, in sometimes maybe we are lucky and choose exactly the right size of parameters, but in many cases uh, we will either use too large parameters and then raise computational eff efficiency, or it's the other way around, uh, we have chosen them um, too small and then again we do not benefit from our uh, security proofs. Okay, so uh, the objective of this talk is to give an overview about a couple of results about tight security. Um, we start uh, with a very theoretical result, um, and I'm only going to use this result here, so I'm not going to into details here, I'm not going to explain this protocol uh, in, in great detail and so on, 
but I'm going to use this as an excuse uh, or as a, as, a, as a reason to uh, show you a new security notion for digital signatures and to explain why it is particularly difficult to achieve the security notion uh, with a tight security proof. Um, then we will talk about a more recent result from last year, uh, and uh, this gives us a more efficient protocol, but it shows that essentially that we cannot prove uh, the standard Diffie-Hellman protocol tightly secure because we run into the so-called commitment problem. Um, I'm also going to explain uh, what this exactly means. And finally, uh, I'm going to show very briefly uh, what the current state of the art is with a, a paper from this year's crypto. So, okay, so this is the first result. First of all, okay, this paper introduces a key exchange protocol and um, originally in this talk I had a slide which shows this protocol but it was just too ugly to, to show it here, okay, it's, it's, uh, it's not very nice. So, but, the, but the basic idea is super simple. Um, if I give you a digital signature scheme and a uh, public key encryption scheme and tell you, okay, please create an AKE protocol from this, then most likely what you're going to create is exactly how the protocol looks like. Okay? So the idea is basically Alice and Bob have long-term signature keys um, and uh, the protocol, well, it, it's much more complex because it also uses one-time signatures and camps and so on and so on, but the basic idea behind the protocol is basically Alice generates a key pair for the public key encryption scheme, a fresh one for each protocol execution, a new one, uh, sends the signed public key over to Bob. Bob responds uh, with a ciphertext with respect to this key and the result from that, that uh, uh, both parties obtain from decrypting the ciphertext here is um, the, the shared session key. Okay, so that's the idea. Um, and if we make the right assumptions about the security of the underlying building blocks, so if we assume that the signature scheme uh, is tightly secure in an appropriate multi-user setting. I'm going to explain this in a minute. Um, and if the public key encryption scheme is secure, then we immediately get a tight security proof uh, for the protocol. Okay. Um, so this sounds a bit trivial. Yeah? Assuming that our building blocks are tightly secure, we get a tight security protocol. But uh, it, is, it turned out also out to be quite useful in the sense that uh, it reduces the relative complex task of constructing an AKE protocol in these complex models with reveals and corruptions and so on and so on to the much simpler task of constructing secure signature schemes and secure public key encryption schemes. Okay? So this, this makes sense. Um, the construction of public key encryption scheme is, uh, is relatively easy. So basically the, uh, uh, the, the now are young uh, construction uh, of, of CCA secure encryption from CPA secure encryption uh, from the 90s uh, works immediately here. Uh, what is more interesting is the question how do we construct suitably secure signature schemes. So what is the difficulty here? Um, the security notion that we need uh, has a beautiful name. It is uh, multi-user existential unforgeability under chosen message attacks with adaptive corruptions. So uh, this uh, security experiment basically works as follows. Um, we have a challenger on the left-hand side, we have the attacker on the right-hand side. The challenger generates uh, U different public keys, intuitively one public key for each user of the protocol. Uh, and now the adversary is allowed to ask two different types of queries. So the first one are signing queries, and this means the attacker outputs a message M and an index I. Uh, the index I points to one of these public keys here. And then the challenger would uh, use the corresponding secret key to sign the message and return the signature. Okay, this is a standard signing oracle um, that you know from a UFCMA security. And second, the attacker is allowed to adaptively corrupt uh, users here, which means it outputs some index J and it receives back the corresponding secret key. And finally, the attacker outputs uh, three values, uh, signature, sigma star, a message M star, and an index I star. And we say that basically A breaks the security of the signature scheme if this is a valid signature, and the attacker is non-trivial, which means that it must not have asked for a signature for this particular message under this uh, given secret key, and of course it must not have asked for the corresponding secret key, okay? because otherwise it's quite pointless. Um, yeah, so this is, this is the security notion that we want to achieve. And those of you uh, familiar with uh, provable security will already have seen that this security notion is immediately implied by the standard security notion that we normally use for signature schemes. So it's called uh, EOFCMA security, okay? 
And uh, how would we prove this? Well, we uh, use a so-called partitioning argument. And in this partitioning argument, we would have a reduction. The reduction um, uh, guesses uh, the index i star um, and generates all secret keys except for the secret key for i star. And then it hopes that the adversary forges a signature exactly for this i star here. And uh, then it gets a signature, uh, a valid signature for the EUFC max security experiment. Okay. But the problem here is that this uh, straightforward textbook reduction here uh, is a lossy uh, in the sense that it has a linear security loss on the number of users. So it's not tight. Um, so why is it now very difficult to get a tight security uh, uh, proof uh, for a signature scheme in the sense? So um, the problem is that uh, if you want to uh, avoid any such partitioning argument, then we have to create a reduction which knows all secret keys for all users all the time throughout the experiment because it has to be prepared in case the adversary asks for a corruption of one of the secret keys. Okay. And at the same time, the reduction must uh, also be able to solve some computationally hard problem uh, by extracting the solution for, of this problem from, from the given signature while knowing at the same time a corresponding uh, signing key that it could use to create a signature himself. Okay, at the first glance, this here looks exactly like this here. Okay, so it seems uh, to be uh, well, uh, somewhat contradictory. Okay, but uh, it turns out that, uh, that, it's, that it is possible to uh, construct suitable signature schemes. And this uh, basically works, works as follows. Um, so uh, the, signature, the signature scheme that we're going to construct uh, generates keys as follows. So first of all, it uses a uh, non-interactive proof system. Okay, I'm not going to go too much into detail, so we need witness indistinguishability and so on, but uh, don't worry about this. So a common reference string for a proof system. Um, then uh, it creates two uh, uh, key pairs from an underlying signature scheme. Okay. And then the resulting verification key uh, for the signature scene corresponds to, uh, 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 corresponds to both verification keys and the common reference string. But the secret key here, okay, this is, uh, this is important, um, belongs uh, to only one of these two verification keys here, and which one is chosen at random, okay? So in the key generation, the, the algorithm picks a random bit data, 0 or 1, keeps only one of both secret keys, and discards the other one. This will be very helpful later in order to provide a simulation where the, where the reduction outputs um, uh, suitable secret keys. Okay. In order to create a signature, the sign algorithm basically um, uses the uh, secret key that it knows to create a signature and sets a second signature value to just some arbitrary constant, let's say one. Okay. So we have a valid signature and some string. And then the actual signature that is returned by the algorithm is a proof of knowledge of a tuple S0 and S1 such that either the either S0 is a valid signature or S1 is a valid signature. Okay? So we prove this and uh, this is convincing enough of course for an, um, uh, for an verifier uh, to check that, uh, well, that, that the signer knows at least one of these two secret keys and uh, this is the idea um, uh, uh, why the scheme is secure. Okay? So how can we exploit this to get um, a tight security proof? So what we do is basically, in the actual security proof, we replace this constant here with a signature with respect to the other secret key. Okay, this is the first step. We do this for all signatures that the adversary sees. Then we make the common reference string witness extractable, which basically means that, that we can extract from this proof here at least one of the signatures. Okay, um, and finally, um, yeah, that's what we do. So the idea is here that by, by modifying the sign algorithm such that uh, the signature contains signatures with respect to both keys, we information theoretically hide which secret key is known to us. And then by the security of the proof system, we can later extract one of the two signatures. And if we are lucky, then uh, it is exactly the signature that belongs to the secret key that we do not know anymore. Okay, and then we can forward this to the signature security experiment. Okay, this is on a very high level idea uh, behind this. And uh, as you can see, we know all the time a secret key which looks valid, which is properly distributed, and so on and so on. So we can output it uh, to the adversary in order to simulate the uh, multi-user EUFCMA security experiment with corruptions.
Okay, um, so this, uh, this, this, this uh, looks pretty nice, but unfortunately it doesn't give us a very efficient signature scheme. So uh, one, one approach to instantiate is, is to use uh, signature schemes from, a, from an older paper, from Crypto 12. And uh, from a theoretical point of view, this is nice, uh, because it gives us a completely tight security proof with constant security loss. But unfortunately, uh, the, the uh, efficiency of the scheme is absolutely absurd from a practical point of view. We have hundreds of group elements, so if you have a battery-powered IoT device or whatever and you want to send a signature, then this will drain your battery uh, with a single signature maybe. Okay. So this is what we call uh, maybe TCC efficient. Okay, Everything is in polynomial time and so on, so it's good enough uh, to get published at TCC, but maybe not at CCC. Um, and then there is a second construction, which is better. Uh, let's say TCC practical. So uh, here we have, uh, yeah, let's say, 18 uh, 18 strings of size about size the security parameter depending on how we instantiate this here. Um, it's, it's not as nice as this one here because we have a linear security loss, but uh, at least it's not completely ridiculous. Anymore. Okay. So this was the state of the art until about 2018 in the security exchange protocols. Okay, so uh, now on to the next result. Um, the objective of this paper is now to get something which is which can really be considered practical. Um, so what we want is we want a, a really simple and efficient protocol, which ideally is as simple as let's say signed DVM or some some standard very well known protocol, easy to implement and so on, and which uses simple and robust uh, cryptographies or just standard arbitrary groups, whatever elliptic curve groups or so on, uh, no pairings and, and stuff like this, which are not uh, not yet available in many software libraries and so on and so on. So, and the natural approach, which we also followed here, is uh, basically from the simplest uh, authenticated key exchange protocol that we could think of, uh, scientific hammer. Um, then uh, uh, we noticed that we run into this commitment problem that I'm going to explain next. Uh, and then once we resolve this problem here, we can combine this with a suitable signature scheme. We also had to construct a new one here because the others uh, uh, that I showed you before are not efficient enough and in the end then you get a very very uh, simple protocol which can actually be uh, instantiated even more efficiently than uh, scientific Hellman if you choose um, uh, theoretical sound parameters. So uh, yeah very quickly here's the scientific Hellman protocol so user u1 has a, uh, a long-term key pair which is the key pair for signature scheme u2 as well uh, and then well uh, user u1 here picks some, some exponent a, computes g to the a, this gives us some message a, this message is signed and sent over uh, to the other user. Um, yeah, user u2 responds accordingly and the key of course is g to the a b, okay, the diffie of key. So the problem that we face if we want to prove this protocol is secure, tightly secure, is, uh, is this one here. So if we want to construct a reduction, then this reduction um, May or will, or will have to uh, output uh, one of these tuples here to the adversary at some point. Okay, the adversary will ask the reduction. Well, I wanted to establish a key between user one and user two. The attacker controls the network. This means that it would receive G to the A and a valid signature over G to the A. Okay, and now there are two different possibilities. The first one is this here. The adversary could simply forward this message to the other user. Um, the uh, other user would respond with G to the B and some signature, the adversary would forward it as well, and then it could ask the test query for this one here. And then we would respond with G to the AB or random, and you can prove this secure if you make the DDH assumption, which basically says that uh, G to the AB is indistinguishable from random, um, given G to the A and G to the B, but not the corresponding exponents. Okay? So, in this case, the adversary essentially must not know uh, the exponent A of G to the A because otherwise it would be able to, to compute this key here itself and would not be able to extract anything new from the adversary. Okay? So this is the first case. In this case, the reduction must not know the exponent. But the second case, which might also happen in the security experiment, is that the reduction outputs this, uh, this, this tuple here. The adversary now corrupts the other user and gets back the signature key. And then it chooses the exponent B itself, signs it using the signature key that it has just obtained, and then asks reveal. And this basically forces the reduction to output the correct secret key down here, and it can only do so uh, by knowing this exponent A. Okay? 
So in this world here, the reduction must know the exponent. And uh, so this basically means that whenever the reduction here outputs some g to the a, then it is some sort of commitment for the reduction whether it knows a or not. And the only way that we knew, uh, or that, that we actually know today for Scientific Fairman in order to prove it secure, is to guess which particular, um, which particular queries by the adversary here correspond later to the test query. We embed the DDH challenge only into exactly these queries here, and then we get our credit security loss, and, and we're stuck with that. Okay. So, um, yeah, exactly, that's what I just said. So how do we resolve this? Um, turns out that there is a very, uh, very simple solution. We just add one message to the protocol. Um, so this is signed to uh, except that uh, the user U1 here initially uh, doesn't send G to the A at the signature, but it just sends the hash of G to the A. Okay? Um, funnily, this is a commitment which resolves the commitment problem. Okay? Um, so this is some value Y. Then uh, the user U2 would respond with B and a corresponding signature. And finally, user, a, uh, um, user 1 would send A and uh, the signature here. And user 2 would check whether this A here is indeed the value uh, which is contained in this commitment up here. Okay. So why does this help us? Well, what we can do now in the proof is the following. Um, whenever the adversary asks to initiate a session between these two users here, um, the reduction can simply output some string y, okay, which, uh, which corresponds to some hash value. And now, if the adversary turns out to, uh, to forward this value to the other user and forward the response as well, then the reduction can later open this commitment here to some value g to the a from the DDH challenge. Okay? So we do this, uh, for instance, think about a random oracle. Okay? We can later uh, reprogram the hash function such that any uh, given value that we want maps to this y here, okay, and, and response sent to this value here, and we have embedded the DDH challenge and everything is fine. Um, and then of course the test query also works. Or alternatively, if, it, if the adversary turns out to choose B itself, then we would just pick A ourselves, compute G to the A, define the hash of G to the A as this value y here, output this one, and again, we, uh, we are able to get a, a reduction through. So, um, yeah, so what this commitment up here allows us is that the reduction can decide on demand uh, and later, okay, at, only at this point here when it receives back the response from the adversary, only then it is able to decide uh, whether it wants to embed a DDH challenge or not. Uh, so we do not have to guess anything and this later makes it possible for us to get tight security. Um, and yeah, one uh, way to instantiate this here is either to, uh, to, to model uh, the hash function as a random oracle, uh, which we can reprogram then, or if you do not like the random oracle model, if you want it to be in a standard model, then this also works by using a suitable commitment scheme, which can be opened in different ways later on. So um, yeah, so this is, this is the protocol that we get, and uh, what is also very nice about this is that uh, actually it's not, I mean, we have an extra message, uh, so this might, might make the protocol somewhat less practical because it increases the latency, but actually it does not for most practical applications because if you consider a scientific Hellman, then the latency of this protocol is basically one round trip time. At this point here the key is established and then uh, the, let's say the client here is able to send the first request to a server. And it's exactly the same uh, with this three message protocol. So the client was, would instantiate this, get back the response, and then it is able to send uh, its encrypted data here along with this message here, so the latency is more or less the same, okay? except that we send a couple of extra bits here. Good. Um, yeah, so um, this is the protocol. We also need a suitable signature scheme. So we con constructed one using, uh, using the same approach uh, that I've shown before, instantiated with different uh, uh, techniques and so on and so on. So I'm not going to go into details here. And uh, of course, uh, I mean, what I just showed you is how it, how it works in the ideal world, and in the real world, everything is much more messy. So the suitable, uh, so the building blocks that we used were not all not really suitable. But if you sort of play Lego with it long enough, uh, then you find uh, building blocks that match, and you get something uh, where everything works. Okay. Good. So um, comparing this to scientific Elman, so first of all, uh, we have here scientific Elman, and then the entire protocol, so uh, 
computing uh, DVL-MAN shares, uh, computing signatures, verifying signatures, and so on and so on. Essentially, costs five exponentiation. For our protocol, instantiated with the more efficient signature scheme, this takes 17 exponentiations. So this is 3.4 three times more expensive here, okay, which, is, which is bad. Yeah. But if you instantiate this with uh, suitable parameters, then uh, even for a, let's say, medium scale setting with 2 to the 16 users and 2 to the 16 sessions per user, um, if you want to instantiate scientific Hellman, and if we take the security loss of the reduction into account for these parameters, then we uh, need to use a, uh, let's say, 300 uh, bit curve here. Um, uh, for this one, while uh, a 256 bit curve is sufficient for our tightly secure protocol, which means that we are more efficient by, uh, so, uh, yeah, so which where, where one exponentiation in this group here is about 2.7 times more efficient than in this group here. Okay? So which means that uh, we get basically 3.4 divided by 2.7, which is, I'm an engineer, which is close to one, okay, for me. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, but larger than one, okay. And then if you look at a larger scale setting with a uh, four, four billion users uh, and uh, as many sessions, okay, then uh, we get even this factor 7.7 .7, and in this case we are more, more efficient here, okay. So uh, this is not yet, not yet maybe what you want to use in practice, but at least it's, it's heading in the right direction compared to the, uh, to the previous result from TCC before. Okay. Good, okay, and finally, very quickly, uh, the last result here uh, from this year's crypto. So uh, here we have an even simpler protocol, uh, which doesn't need any signatures. So the idea of this protocol is basically the long-term key pair of Alice is uh, G to the A, uh, for some random exponent A, Bob has a similar key pair up here, and the key exchange it itself uh, is just a standard textbook Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Okay, so uh, Alice sends G to the R, Bob sends back G to the S with a female exponent S, and these are, let's say, tied um, to the to the long-term secrets here by using an appropriate key derivation function, which basically mixes different exponents. Okay, uh, female exponent, long-term exponent, and so on and so on. So uh, one can prove this year um, somewhat tightly secure. Um, so first of all, um, yeah, first of all, one novelty is this. Uh, I mean, if you if you have paid attention uh, five minutes ago, then you have seen uh, that this protocol here suffers from the same commitment problem uh, that I've showed you before, and it seems that we cannot prove tight security for this. But um, by using this this key derivation down here, we can use a different trick. And this trick is basically where well, we are not able to pretend uh, to compute keys. So what we do in the, uh, in the reduction is we just pretend that we were able to compute keys. Okay. So this means that whenever the adversary asks for this particular key here, and we have embedded challenges into these values here, then we are not able to compute the hash input here. So what we do is we just output a string k and say, well, trust us. Okay. This is this is the, uh, the corresponding key. Uh, and uh, a technical difficulty is that we have to make sure that whenever the adversary asks for hash values here in the random oracle model, then we have to make sure that the, that the answers are consistent. And um, yeah, so in this very simple protocol here, we need a TDH oracle for that, which is somewhat cheating, right? Because we get a tightly secret protocol under very strong assumption given a TDH oracle, uh, we can solve the CDH problem here. Um, so uh, yeah, what we have now is a, a very efficient protocol. I cannot imagine any 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 simpler key exchange protocol if I if I just look here at the messages that are transmitted, um, which unfortunately has a linear security loss in the number of users. Okay, but this is much better than quadratic in the number of users times the number of sessions, of course. And it's of course based on a very strong assumption, this this oracle assumption. I'm not even yet sure if it's falsifiable or not. Okay, so th this is bad but we can do a little bit better by uh, giving here an extra group element, a second group element in the messages. Uh, we get a security proof uh, that is basically based on the standard computational DFM assumption. This uses uh, this, this uh, so-called twinning technique. Um, and uh, the resulting protocol is, so I wasn't really sure if I should make the efficiency here yellow or green. Uh, because it's less efficient than the previous one, but it's only one extra group element and a handful of exponentiation, so it's quite okay, I guess. Um, the security loss is still linear in the number of users, but it's based on a, on a well-established standard assumption, um, which is nice. 
and it also turns out that we cannot do better than this linear security loss. Um, so uh, what we also prove in this paper is that if we have a scheme which has unique long-term keys, so where for each public key there exists only one unique string that is the matching secret key, uh, or if some other property is satisfied, um, then we cannot, cannot do better than the linear loss, which means that uh, this applies to all these high efficiency protocols that we're using in practice today or that are state of the art in academia. They all cannot have a tight security proof. Okay. Good. So, to conclude, um, tightly secure AKE protocols exist, uh, also in relatively strong security models where we have um, powerful adversaries that can corrupt users, that can reveal keys, and so on, and all this adaptively. Um, if we want to have this all completely in the standard model without any random oracles, then the best thing that we get is uh, what I call a TCC practical. But uh, we can actually be uh, even more efficient than, than scientific Elman uh, with uh, theoretically sound parameters. Uh, and uh, yeah, also almost as efficient as, let's say, textbook Diffie Hellman, unauthenticated Diffie Hellman, uh, if we are able to accept a, a linear security loss. And, uh, yeah, so uh, along the way we develop new security notions and so on and so on. Okay. So a couple of open problems. Um, first of all, uh, are there any, any better ideas uh, to get tightly secure AKE protocols to overcome all these different problems that we have there? Um, so is it possible to get textbook DFM or with constant security loss? So far we have linear loss and it's be a pretty cool result, I guess. Um, and of course, uh, more efficient signatures would also be quite interesting because uh, yeah, so the smallest signature scheme that we have so far consists of, I think, 14 group elements, which is much worse than ECDSA or so, okay, even with uh, theoretically some parameters. And uh, of course, uh, well, other primitives are interesting as well. So tightly secure instant messaging could be interesting. Uh, maybe we could talk about this at some point. Tightly secure multi-party computation or whatever complex comp uh, primitive you have uh, yeah, uh, would make sense from my point of view. That's it. Thank you very much for staying. Uh, and uh, do you have any questions? <laughs>